our keynote speaker today comes to us from the University of Maryland, Baltimore County. Dr. Gregory Williams has over 25 years of experience as a faculty member, instructional designer, e-learning developer, and consultant. He has designed and taught online courses at UMBC and other universities. He is the director of UMBC's graduate program in instructional <coughs> systems development and teaches as an associate professor. Dr. Williams completed his undergraduate degrees at the State University of New York at Plattsburgh and his doctorate at the George Washington University. Dr. Williams also provides instructional design and e-learning consulting services as well as recruitment and placement services. Please join me now in welcoming Dr. Williams. Good. I've been instructed by the tech staff not to wander far from the podium because there's <laughs> invisible barbed wire that will be brought up and I'll be reined in. So what I'm going to spend the next 30 minutes or so talking about is hopefully something that is near and dear to you. What you need to know about me is I'm a teacher. Okay. I, don't, I, I am a graduate program director, which means I run a graduate program, but I'm a teacher. I started out as, um, I'm so old, they used to call it junior high before middle school. Junior high and high school, and I was a guidance counselor in a K through 12 school in, in upstate New York, um, not too far from where I grew up. But um, I had opportunities with um, UMBC to get involved in online learning, and uh, it was fun, it was challenging, it was hard, but what I'm learning is that you actually have more opportunities and support here than I did when I started. <laughs> so it should be easier. Um, I want to frame my talk and I want to make it interactive because like any good faculty member, if you open up that blue folder, open up your blue folder. Good, good, I like that. An evaluation form. Under keynote speaker, it says something like, is the keynote speaker or was he engaging? So I'm going to engage you. <laughs> Feel free to ask questions at, at any time. Um, that's, we're going to have a Q&A after, but um, you probably don't know what I'm going to talk about. Because I looked through the materials and it just said that I'm going to talk, but you have no idea what I'm going to talk about. <laughs> what do you want to learn? I'm engaging you right now. <laughs> What do you want to learn? I'm being serious. <laughs> okay, I'm going to do that. I anticipated that question, but thanks for asking. What else? Yes, sir. How do you get students to better leverage their mobile devices in class? Okay, I'm going to touch on that. Yes, sir. What are you doing that we're not that we can steal from you? <laughs> Okay, that's a good one. I like that. Those are all good questions. Okay, so I'm going to try to show my experience. Um, and I'm going to frame this whole thing in um, a friend of mine, Jim Mannion, who um, in the late 80s, early 90s, I worked with him at Montgomery College. He was an adjunct faculty there. And Jim at the time was pushing 70. Very smart guy. He was the retired chairperson of the Gaelic Studies program at Georgetown University and he loved to teach so he taught at probably half a dozen different schools around the greater DC area um, and he said to me this is like in 1988 he goes Greg I'm reading about this e-learning thing it's gonna be big he's like I'm gonna do it so he was right probably two years later Jim was teaching online courses for University of Maryland uh, University College. So here's a guy, he really had nothing to really prove. He'd already had a great career in, in academia, but this interested, it interested him and it motivated him. And I think sometimes when your motivation is big enough, you forget about the struggles so much um, and you kind of move forward. So if Jim can do it and I can do it, you can do it. You're smart people. You wouldn't be here doing what you, you're doing if you weren't smart, right? Okay? It's not about the technology. We're going to talk about that. 
A lot of people don't get e-learning, like my, my friend here. They think that e-learning is a fad. And whether you agree or disagree that e-learning is a good thing, um, my, Greg's prediction, and I'm engaging you here, is it's not going away. It's not going away. It might look different. It might feel different. It might seem different 20 years from now, but it's not going away. So if you're parents and you tell your kids things aren't going away, what do you tell them? It's like, well, you got, you got to deal with it. You have to cope with it. You have to adapt. Um, this is one of my favorite quotes from American uh, philosopher and uh, author, Eric Hoffer. What, what does this quote mean to you? And he wrote this probably about 30 years ago. Any thoughts on what this means to you? Learning is ongoing and you have to be adaptable. Yeah, uh, absolutely. Any other ones? I'm engaging you, remember. <laughs> yes, way in the back. I'm engaged. We have to keep on learning. Okay, that's good. To me, it's, it's about adapting. Learning is really, in my estimation, it's, it's ongoing. I know you've heard that. But it really is never more true than in the field of uh, e-learning. So, you know, the dinosaurs were roaming the earth and they became extinct, right? One of their big claim to fame was they could just crush their predators. But the real reason they're gone is they didn't develop PC skills. <laughs> so they went obsolete. The Ice Age took them over, among other things, I guess. Um, so here's my prediction with e-learning. At some point, e-learning in the future will just be learning, OK? I became a dad relatively late in life, so I still have, a, uh, I have two sons. One's 16, one is 11. And the one who's 11, by the time he goes to college, if you don't have an online presence, if you don't have videos, if you don't have audio content, interactive content, he's probably, he and his peers are going to wonder, why not? Like, what's up with you guys? Why don't you do this? Because he's growing up in an age, again, whether we like it or not, that, that technology is always present. And the expectation is that you do something with it. We have... Um, faculty at UMBC that are very engaged in technology, and there's others that don't. And sometimes students ask the faculty that aren't as engaged, how come you don't do much in Blackboard? Or how come you don't have videos? How come you don't do this and that? And you're actually probably accomplishing a lot more in terms of e-learning here than we are at UMBC, because e-learning for us, while it's there, it's not a priority. I wish it were, because I'm heavily involved in it. But the E's going to disappear, okay? Probably, I'm not sure when, maybe, you know, all right, Dylan is 11 right now. Maybe not by the time that he gets to college. But at some point, we're not going to, they're going to meld. They're going to be the same because there's some definitions of blended learning which throws in a percentage and, you know, if, if it's, you know, 20% or 30% that's online versus in person. And at some point, we're not going to notice and we're not going to care so much. Now, there are a lot of, you know, when I was in ninth grade, there were a lot of expectations as, as a new high school student. But where I grew up, you had to read the book, Great Expectations. Anybody read Great Expectations? It wasn't my favorite book, but I read it. And I think kids now, they have this, you know, they're wondering, their expectations now is like my son Dylan. He's, he's going to wonder, where's the tutorial? Where's the Khan Academy video that shows me how to do this? Um, are you familiar with the Khan, Khan Academy? So when I use that with, with my son, um, as we know, there's different ways to do math problems. And when I do, you know, and he's in fifth grade, so it's like, are you smarter than the fifth grader? It's probably not, no. Um, I do the math my way, and he look, I get the right answer. And he said to me, Dad, that's not how you do it. <laughs> but I got the right answer. He goes, yeah, but it's not, that's not how you do it. So, but what Dylan's going to expect, they're going to ex expect this. And they're probably not going to be passive about it. Um, so what do your students expect from you? What do they expect? 
I'm engaging you again. Yes, ma'am. A short response time. So immediate right. response to a 2 a.m. Sure. Like I tell my students, I'm waiting at 3 a.m. at my computer at home for your email. So I respond right away. What else do they expect? Yes. Yeah, a lot of text heavy, okay? When my friend Jim Mannion taught courses online, okay, back in the late 80s, and maybe the technology people can appreciate this more, but they had what they called a bulletin board system. Does every, anybody remember <coughs> bulletin boards? You logged into a computer and basically you couldn't even vary like this or vary like that because the monitors at that point, you couldn't even see it unless you were like straight on and it was all text and it was like just basic coding. It l looked like a bulletin board, but all text. No, no videos, no graphics. Um, when I took my first online course, it was all based using Outlook Express as an email. You know, go figure. I'm not sure why they did that, but anyway, it was a lot more difficult then. But they, they do expect things beyond text now. I do. What else do they expect from you? Give me one thing and I'll move on. I think like Jason was saying, that piece in the classroom, okay, where there's a lot of technology and uh, you're not telling them to put their mobile phones away. Right. To get their mobile phones away. Right. And yeah. us baby boomers, that's really hard to do. Right. But they expect that. Okay. Thank you for sharing that. So I was hired at UMBC in 2004 and I'll share with you my journey because I think I'm kind of an average guy. I'm not super intelligent. I'm not super dumb. I'm kind of there in the middle. Um, you know, my, my family might say different things. Um, but 2004 was a challenging year for me. There was a lot going on in my life. I, I was busy. I got married in 2004 for the first time. I bought a new house in 2004. I started a new job at UMBC. 2004. Um, my wife and I <clears throat> adopted two kids. I was caretaker for my mom. And every family has to have a dog. <laughs> so we got Zorro. So I was busy. And um, when I started at UMBC, they said, okay, you're running this graduate program. It's, instru it's in instructional systems uh, development. And um, here's your priority. Your priority is increase enrollment because enrollment's been going down. So you really got to get the enrollment up. And I said, how long do I have to do that? And they said, well, we're giving you a year contract. <laughs> I'm not making this up. And I said, wow, because things move so fast in higher education, I get a whole year? <laughs> Terrific. And they said, oh, by the way, you have a faculty rank, so you're going to have to teach a load of faculty of courses. And by the way, your courses and your program are online. And I said, oh, no problem. I was lying. It was a problem. I had never taught an online course before. So, you know, I had tons of time. So, sure, I'll teach online. That's okay. So kind of felt like dumb and dumber, and then me is the dumbest. It's like, why did I do this? This is the dumbest thing I've agreed to do, and as my wife would say, just say no. It's like, I couldn't, it was the job. I had to accept that, or there, there was no job there. So my e-learning journey, uh, I really was clueless. If I had a picture like this of me, I would have put it up there, but um, I, I really didn't know what I didn't know. I had, there were lots of challenges, I made a lot of mistakes, um, but it was good that I didn't know because if I knew, I'd probably be afraid to do certain things. But I was so open and, all right, I'm going to try this. Um, as my wife tells me, one of your strengths is you don't mind looking stupid. You don't mind looking foolish. And I, I don't. So here are my challenges. I really had little to no training in e-learning. Um, I'd never had taught online before. Teaching was not a priority for me as an evaluation, as an employee. 
Um, it was part of it, but it was the big push was increase enrollment and do it in a year, which of course, you know, I could just push that button and of course enrollment increases. Um, I really didn't know what I didn't know. Um, I was in a department, we're in the education department, and they're focused on teacher education. They're not focused on instructional design, e-learning. So I really didn't have a lot of help from my colleagues. So that was a challenge. There's not a lot of online courses at UMBC. You have tons more here, tons, way more. I really had little time with everything that was going on. So, um, and again, they gave me a whole 12 months to show some uh, improvement. But here's, here's what I learned, was that I wasn't alone. There were people like me. I found them somehow. And um, like when I first got out of graduate school and started as a teacher and a guidance counselor in a small town in upstate New York, um, the school districts in upstate New York are not county-based. They are within each little town. So like Catonsville has its own you know, high school and um, et cetera. So it's, it's different. So I was, the, I was in a small rural school, so I was the only guidance counselor. Well, I was just out of graduate school. I really didn't know how to be a guidance counselor. I'd done an internship and all that, but I was like 23 years old. What did I know? So I sought out the other guidance counselors from the neighboring schools and the neighboring districts and made friends with them. Well, I did that with e-learning too. I sought out people that taught online and said, how do you do this and what do I do about that? And I kind of created my own network um, of e-learning folks. Then the other thing I realized was, well, my wife's right. I, I really shouldn't be afraid of making mistakes. Because when you make mistakes, I don't know about you, but I, I learn. Do you learn when you make mistakes? That's probably the biggest thing that I do and I, I was like, wow. Even if it's, I'm not gonna do this again. Um, so I learned a lot because I wasn't afraid to make mistakes. You can't break things. And then I realized that my penchant to be perfect was better, I was better off looking at, well, okay, I'll get better. I don't need to be perfect, but I need to get better. And I wanna improve, I wanna get better. Um, this is a real person, this is Greg Walsh. Greg Walsh um, used to teach in our program. He now teaches at the University of uh, Baltimore downtown. But I went to him and I said, um, he was the most engaged technology wise. And I said, Greg, I want you to um, teach me all about, I said, I wanna learn how to, this is in 2004, show me how to create videos that then I can share. And he said, okay. He said, but first I have to teach you about file transfer protocol. And I kind of knew what that was, and what I knew wasn't fun. And I was avoiding that. And I said, well, can we just kind of skip that part and get into the fun stuff? He said, well, your biggest challenge is gonna be not creating the videos, but getting them from point A to, to point B. And one of the things I've learned is if you wait long enough in technology, a new technology comes out that basically jumps over where you were and doesn't require you to do certain things. So this was before like, you know, Apple's had that share button. You know, you couldn't share back then. You had to do file transfer protocol. But anyway, your colleagues can be a big help. The other thing was I realized that getting feedback from people was, was very important. How am I doing? Am I not doing very well? If so, what could I improve? So if you're open to hearing about feedback, from your colleagues, from your students, and other professionals, that's very, very helpful. Um, I also learned that, um, hopefully most people know who that is. He's retired. People know Michael Jordan? Okay, Michael Jordan, I'm a big basketball fan. When I told my son that Michael Jordan was cut from his junior varsity team, my son said, get out of here, Dad. I said, no, that's true. He wasn't good enough, he got cut. He said, well, he was probably the best basketball player. How did he get cut? He said, well, he wasn't the best then. He said, well, what did he do? I said, he practiced, 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 practiced. And he made a commitment that says, I'm gonna be the best that I can be. And he put the work in. And it's the same thing. Teaching online is a skill. How do you get better? You do it. You practice. How do you get to be a good violinist? You practice. How do you get to be a good writer? You practice. You write more. So you need to practice. The other thing is you can go to these 
talks like this and you can go to conferences and you might learn some things, but you can't learn how to ride a bike in a seminar, right? You got to get out there on the road and do it. So we can talk about it and we can um, exchange ideas and that's good, but the really good part is getting out there and actually doing it. Um, and you really need to have a plan. Um, this is uh, the Marine Corps Marathon. Long, long time ago, I actually ran in it once. My goal was just to do it, to say that I did it and did it. And uh, a friend of mine talked me into it and she said, well, I, I've run these before and I, and I knew she was a big runner. And I was like, well, you know, I've jogged, the most I've jogged was like four or five miles. And I said, I thought that's, that's pretty long. And um, she said, no, we have, we have a plan. So she had a training schedule that we'll go out on this day and we'll run, you know, three miles and we'll do that for a week and then we'll bump it up to five. And we got up there and then one day, you know, we actually, on a Saturday, ran 20 miles. Well, if you, and I had played sports in college and high school, but if you ever told me a long time ago that, well, you're going to run 20 miles one day, like, you're crazy. I'm not doing that. Well, because I followed her plan and it was the gradual incremental increase where you're, you know, building up your, your stamina and so forth, um, you know, I did it. And then lo and behold, the day of the marathon, uh, I actually finished it and it was about, I don't know, four and a half, four hours and 45 minutes. And it was usually the Marine Corps Marathon is right around the birthday of the Marine Corps, which is like early November. And the bad part that day was it was like literally 84 degrees and hot and humid in Washington, which is not what you want when you run a marathon. But having a plan is good. You don't need to react to this. You need to kind of have a plan. Well, you have lots of things here that, you know, we don't necessarily have. But in general, here's some resources. You know, there's workshops. There's you have a lot of great instructional designers. UMBC, we have like maybe one. Maybe one, that's it. Um, there's lots of online training. I'm a big fan of the lynda.com. Ever, ever used any of the lynda.com videos? They're great. Um, you know, your colleagues, your professional network, um, all kinds of opportunities to, to learn. Um, so I survived my first semester, my first, my first year. Enrollment did go up, and then they gave me another one-year contract. <laughs> so they weren't giving me this long-term Joe Flacco deal with a big signing bonus. Um, they eventually hired me for long-term. So, but you know, things worked out, and so I want to talk about is you know some of these things and the implications for for teaching. One of the things that I learned is. In an online environment, you even need to know a lot more about um, your students and their needs um, because a lot of online teaching, a lot can be misunderstood, a lot of communication can be misunderstood. I mean, it can be misunderstood in this environment, but when you get online, um, a lot of things happen. I'm sure you've had the experience where you send an email to somebody, it's like, hey, what time do you want to eat lunch today? and they respond with, I'm going to the mall at 2.30. Okay, I'm not sure you heard me um, or you listened, but it's really important to try to find out the expectations of, of your learners. Um, one of the things that I always tell students in an online course is, and I think the 99.9% .9 goal is great, but I always tell them that at some point, technology will fail you in this course. I don't know when and I don't know where, but it will fail you. So you have to be prepared. You have to have plan B, plan C, access to another computer, access to a smartphone, et cetera. Because uh, if you teach online, you, you get the electronic version of, you know, my dog ate my homework sort of thing. Um, so I always tell them that you have to have different plan. You also have to think about how you're going to deliver your content. And most higher education faculty um, like to lecture because it's what they know, it's what they're used to, it's what they're familiar with. Students understand it. And some people are really good lecturers and some people are not. But you have to rethink, okay, is this content delivered better in a small group? Is it delivered better with a role play? Um, what can I record ahead of time that students can view and listen to and then when they come in 
they're going to break off into little work groups or teams or they're just going to use this as discussion. I'm going to use this as this discussion. So the old way of, of teaching really, and there's nothing wrong with lecture. Lecture can be very effective, but my message is you need to rethink. You should be doing a, a variety of things because everyone's not a good lecturer. Um, students, uh, not all students, are good note takers, right? So you can be delivering the best lecture in the world and some students aren't getting it. They're not taking down good notes. They're not comprehending. So online makes you rethink your instructional strategies. And when you work with instructional designers, they're going to talk about your instructional strategies and what options um, you might have. And, and literally, there's hundreds and hundreds of different instructional strategies. We kind of go back to the same maybe you know half, half a dozen to 10 of them that we really like. But there's lots of other things. Um, when you do things other than lecture, what do you do for instructional strategies? This is the engagement part again. Small group activities. Small group? OK. What else? Data exploration. Data exploration, OK. What is Becture? I didn't hear that. What is Becture? Oh. Oh. <laughs> I told you I'm not afraid to admit I make mistakes. <laughs> Becture is the question that you have the answer to that you get the door prize as the group proofreader. I probably changed that last night. Okay. So. There's blended learning, right? That's big now. Blended is a combination of in-person and online, and that's, that's getting to be big. Um, the students want information when they want it. So they want this 24-7 thing, and that's their expectation. So that, that can be a challenging, because you know, are you waiting for their message at you know, 3 o'clock in the morning? Probably not. Um, I'm asleep at that time. Um, but it's something that we deal with. So, you know, what you should do in an online course is you have a course policy that says, I will respond to you within X hours. So at least they still might not like that, but at least they know that, okay, if I send my teacher a email message or, or a text or whatever, that they're going to respond to me within 24 to 48 hours, let's say. So at least they know that, okay, there's the expectation. I'll get back to you, but it's not going to be um, immediate. I would encourage you to use familiar tools. And what do I mean by that? Well, don't use that Bexher thing, because I have no idea what Bexher is. <laughs> Cross that tool off the list. Use tools that they already know how to use. For example, I use some YouTube videos. Why do I do that? People have access to it. No one has ever said to me, Hey, Greg, how do I play this YouTube video? <laughs> they already know how to do that. So I piggyback on the familiar. I don't try to force them to new youth, news you things unless it's absolutely necessary. Because really, as instructional designers will tell you, the technology and the tool is chosen last. You don't put that first. You don't say, you know what? I'm going to go out to my garage on Saturday, and I'm going to grab a screwdriver and I'm going to find something to do with it. Right? You don't do that. You think about, what am I doing? I'm painting my deck. Well, I don't need a screwdriver to paint my, net, my net deck. Maybe to open up the can of paint, but in general, you don't need it. So you, you choose that last. But I would encourage you to use things that students already know how to use, ideally. One of the things they do know how to use are phones, right? So one of the things that I've started to do is uh, audio files and podcasts. Now the advantage, I'm going to talk about those a little bit later, but I don't have to tell my 11-year-old, hey Dylan, listen to this audio program. I'll say, here, I'll send you the link to your phone, and he finds it, and he listens to it. So he's 11. He's not a super special kid. He is in my heart, but you know he's not a super gifted and talented kid. He knows how to use a smartphone. A lot of people do. So 
The learning on the go, really, if you think about it, I think somebody asked, you know, how, how do we deal with that? Um, one of the things why it's, it's important is it's just how people use, how they get their information now. Um, there's a lot of people, like one of my student workers who was 21, um, I asked him, I said, you know, how often do you use a desktop computer or even a laptop? He said, only when I come here to work at UMBC in, in this office. He just used maybe either the laptop or mostly his phone. I couldn't do that, but you know, I'm, I'm different than a 22-year-old guy. Um, so you have to think about the design for the mobile because some people think that you can see a lot of information on a screen that's like two by two. Well, you can't, so if you're designing a PowerPoint, you have to think, how will this appear? So, you know, will the person in the back be able to read learning on the go? Those are the things you have to think about. You have to think about, you know, the end, keep that in mind. Um, it used to be in the old days when you created content on YouTube for mobile phones, you had to do a lot more, like check off this box and check off that box. Now, like I said, with the file transfer protocol, you just create the video and then it's, it's done. YouTube, does, YouTube is compatible with smartphones. You really don't have to like resize anything for the most part, but you have to be aware that this is how a lot of students get their information now. A lot of people, not just students. So you have to think about it because it's accessible. One of the things that I'm big on now is, is using audio. And um, why audio? Well, there's free software out there where you can use to create it. Um, Audacity is a great uh, free software that's out there that professionals that are, you know, voiceover people, you know, they use it. And I like it because students can use it on their phone, they can use it on the website, they can listen to it on the website, they can listen to it when maybe they're exercising, you can record a lecture and make it available um, so students can listen to that to help reinforce maybe their in-person experience. You don't have to worry about a great amount of editing. When it's visual, you're really concerned, well, how is this going to look? And should I you know, cut out the part where I said at the beginning about the expectations, or should I live that in? Audio is kind of it's more forgiving, shall we say. You don't have to think about how it looks, because you know, obviously there's, there's no pictures. But audio is um, it's kind of you know, what's old is new. Um, but podcasts actually are ga gaining a lot more popularity and also um, they're available on Google now before podcasts were pretty much uh, Apple's iTunes was like the big 800 pound gorilla but it's really extended beyond that now and it's they're available on Google Play so you can post podcasts on, on Google Play. Um, so this is how I use them to reinforce a lesson you know they're they're accessible but the big technology that you shouldn't ignore is the telephone. A lot of times when I teach online, I'll get like this three-page email from a student with every possible question he or she could answer. And I'll respond and I'll say, can we talk on the phone? And I'll give them a time and we'll talk on the phone. And it's amazing. We, we totally forget about the phone as a technology. We totally forget about it. And what I found is a simple phone call to a student can cut through more confusion and lack of clarity about an assignment, feedback, et cetera, than me you know, responding to the three-page email, then they get it maybe you know, a day or two later, and they said, well, I'm still confused, blah, blah, blah. So don't forget about the phone. Your writing skills for students, as you probably know, are gonna be much more important than ever before, because if it's in person and you ask a student a question, they're going to respond verbally, and maybe they're a very good speaker, but maybe their writing stinks. So that's something you need to think about because that's going to be the primary way, as you know, when you think about it, that they're going to communicate with you. So if they're a poor writer on their papers now, when they get online, chances are they're going to have some communication issues. So that, that's, that's a big implication. So it really is important, especially punctuation, right? Two very different meanings. The power of the <laughs> comma.
comma. So here's another one too. The comma makes a difference. You want the baby seals to stop clubbing. You don't want to beat up the baby seal. We don't, we don't want to do that. So, but online, the communication can go pafluey, right? We know this. Here's a, uh, here's a good one, all right? And I will have to um, give kudos to my colleague, Dr. Thiagi, who's a superstar in my field. Um, this exercise is his. So punctuate this letter. Okay, there's no punctuation. There's no <coughs> punctuation at all. And ideally, I would have had this as the handout for you. And, um, but I wanted to engage you like this as a group. So, all right, see, so you, you kind of get it. You can see how punctuation would probably improve this. Okay? So here's, here's one version, okay? Dear John, I want a man who knows what love is all about. You are generous, kind, thoughtful. People who are not like you admit to being useless and inferior. You have ruined me for other men. I yearn for you. I have no feelings whatsoever when we're apart. I can be happy. I can be forever happy. Will you let me be yours? Gloria. So that's one meaning, just with punctuation. Okay, let's look at a different punctuation that gives a different meaning. Dear John, I want to, we didn't change the words, just the punctuation. I want a man who knows what love is. All about you are generous, kind, thoughtful people who are not like you. Admit to being useless and inferior. You have ruined me. For other men, I yearn. For you, I have no feeling whatsoever. When we're apart, I can be happy forever. Will you let me be yours, Gloria? So, what have we seen? We've seen not even the changing of words. We didn't even change glad to happy, just the punctuation. So as faculty, that's the challenge you're gonna have, one of the challenges in teaching online where written communication is probably more important than ever, and it's something that we have to deal with. So it's really not about the technology, and I don't want you to choose the, the tool first. You know, don't, don't go out to the garage on that Saturday morning and you grab the the screwdriver say, all right, I'm going to use this today. Well, what am I going to do? Well, I don't know, but I have a hammer, and I'm going to use it. So you choose the technology last, all right? It's just a means to an end, right? It helps you communicate. It helps you be more efficient, you know, whatever that tool might do for you. Because the drill, you don't really want a drill. You just want holes, or you want a screw to get screwed in, right? In a way, you don't, want, you don't really need a drill, but you need the end result. It's the same with instructional technology. You need the tool to help you do something, okay? But the tool itself is not important. Some faculty just jump in and they go, oh, this audio thing's great. And next thing you know, everything's in audio on their course. Was it necessary? Probably not, but they fell in love with the tool. So it's okay to like the tool, but don't put that before the learning. Again, it's really not about technology. It's really, in my estimation, it's about change. So some of you might have you know, read about Rosabeth Cantor Moss, who's a big expert on, on change at Harvard. And I've kind of um, summarized some of her work here. Loss of control, that's what we fear. Competence, technology can create fears about competence. You don't look as smart. College faculty are supposed to be smart, erudite people. You know, we might lose face because maybe we might look silly because we don't know how to manipulate Blackboard the way we want to manipulate Blackboard. Um, it's more work. You've got to learn how to use this stuff. Well, that's, that's true. You do have to learn how to use it. And maybe there's past resentments that, you know, they're always trying to make me to do this and I don't really want to do it and they're just sticking it to me again. Does that happen sometimes? Yeah, not always, but it's there. So relate this to technology because, you know, they're opening my class up to the world now or more people can see it. I'll be looked like I'm um, incompetent because I don't know how to use these tools. Um, uh, I'm a great in-person teacher. I'm not sure I'm gonna be a good online teacher. So these are all things that 
really aren't about the technology. It's just about change in general, because you could substitute the word you know, technology with anything. You could say, you know, new president. You could say different location. Whatever it might be, there's concerns about change. So sometimes change causes fear. We know that. Fear necessarily, you know, what, what's a better word for fear? Fear sounds too scary. What, what word should I use that of fear? Anxiety? That sounds better. Okay. It does create stress. But so here's some common fears in the workplace. Well, change might cause me to lose my budget. My salary might change, etc. I might lo lose my circle of friends, my kind of professional network. I could lose, you know, control, power, status. I might have to teach different courses that I teach right now. It's all about change. Um, I might have to learn how to teach online, which means I lecture a lot now. Maybe I have to do something different. Um, we're, we're afraid of, you know, new things in general sometimes. You know, I'm not involved in the process. I am involved in the process. Uh, so it's really, it's not about the technology. But to me, one of the big things is it's about self-efficacy. And self-efficacy is a big word for do I believe that I can do this? That's all it is. And that's a, a more official definition, I guess. But it's a, it's a belief, can I do this? Can I do this technology thing? And my message to you is, yeah, you can, because you're smart people, you're competent, you wouldn't be here, they wouldn't have hired you, they wouldn't have kept you here if you're not. Abe Lincoln, this doesn't relate exactly to self-efficacy, but I, th I think it has, Abe has a point here. And basically it's like, you decide yourself. Are you happy? Are you competent? Okay. Because like when people are sad, why would we choose to be sad? It's a bad choice. Sometimes we're initially sad about something that happens, but you don't want to be sad for a long period of time. That's not a, not a fun thing. So self-efficacy is a good thing to have in a positive way, a strong self-efficacy. You know, you view things as challenges, and when you get more involved, you get more confidence in yourself. You recover quickly from setbacks if you think you can do it. If, you know, yep, I'm going to do this online thing. If you can get past the part like, you know, gee, why doesn't my login work? I just changed this the other day and you're upset, but you can get through it. So it relates to, um, that's not my mom, but someone that probably was close to the same age. My mom told me she wanted to learn, years ago, learn how to use a computer. And my mom was a smart lady. She never went to college, but um, girls in the depression didn't go to college back then. She said she wanted to learn computer skills and so I showed her some things and started out with like just basic mouse skills like click on this and showed her how to like play the solitaire sort of thing. And then one day I asked her, I said, so how are you coming with the computer? She said, oh, just uh, not, I'm not, this is not very good. And my mom was like, very smart lady. Um, I said, well, what, what's wrong? And she said, well, I, I, this technology thing, Greg, I, I, I just can't do it. I said, oh, sure you can, you can do it. I said, show me what, so after much prodding, I said, show me what you were doing where you got stuck. And then she just looked at me and she said, well, you know I can't lie. She said, Greg, I never even tried. No, well, why not, Mom? She said, it's just too overwhelming. She said, there's just like too much to learn, was too new and everything. I'm not a technology person. So her self-efficacy for this one skill was very low. And she never even gave it a shot because in her mind, she had convinced herself that I can't do this. And that belief was so strong and her motivation wasn't super high that she didn't. And that's okay, you know, we still love her and all that. But I think that's the same thing with a lot of people in general. I think my mom's unique in that regard. We get it in our head, we can't do this, we can't do that. Or the positive is you can do it and you can move on. So, all right, how can we address some of these issues that you know, I talked about? One is, well, you wanna keep an open mind. And I know that's like common sense, but we don't sometimes as faculty. We, we think, well, we know how to do this the best. I've been doing this for years. So 
it helped me to keep an open mind, to listen to other people. Um, you probably will need to learn more. And that's just something that it, it is. And I'm not going to say it is what it is, because I hate that saying. But you will have to learn more, because you're not going to automatically you know, morph into a great online teacher if you don't. Um, informal learning is going to be becoming more important. And of course, informal learning is pretty much how we learn in general. When, when we learn a language when we're a baby, mom and dad don't sit us down in a chair and say, OK, we're going to learn how to speak now. You learn informally. And you're going to learn informally with technology and e-learning. You need to stay up to date. You, you can't stay rooted in the past. You know, that's okay because certain things are okay at one point, like this was a cool suit back in 78, right? John Travolta was the man rocking that and that was cool. I kind of had a suit like that actually back then. You need to have a plan, okay? You, you just can't react and kind of pick this up. You have a lot of resources available to you. There's more now available than ever in terms of if people really want to engage and, and go online and learn. And there's a lot of opportunities out there. So certain things you look at and you say, well, is this good or is this bad? So you look at this situation and you can have a couple different outlooks on this. Um, when I was in eighth grade, I went to a Catholic school in eighth grade, and Mr. Loftus was my geography teacher. And I'm not making this up, but every day, he sat down at the desk and he said, class, open up your geography textbook to page 123. And for the entire geography period, he read word for word from the textbook. Every day of school, he did this. And as an eighth grader, I said to myself, you know, I'm not a teacher and I'm not the smartest kid in the class, but I think there's got to be a better way to teach us than this. <laughs> so there were lots of opportunities that Mr. Loftus lost. And then, you know, I fast forward years later to 2011. My son's in middle school. And if you know anything about Libya, in 2011, Gaddafi, who has his name spelled a different way every time I see it, um, was being overthrown as the dictator of Libya. So it was on one of those things that was on CNN. 24 hours, like it was on all the time. People were storming his compound. It was on, so it was on everywhere. Well, um, God bless her. My son's social studies teacher had them, they were studying North Africa at the time. In, Libya's in North Africa. Um, she had them filling out worksheets. I said, Austin, is your teacher saying anything about Gaddafi being overthrown and you know, maybe turning on TV? No, we're just learning about the chief exports. So opportunity lost, real, real bad opportunity lost there. So let's wrap this up. because So what worked in the past is not necessarily going to work in the future for you. Um, you're, you're not going to crack this, master this thing like that. It's going to take some time. You might not like it, but this e-learning thing's not going away, folks. Um, it might look different. It might feel different. It might sound different. Um, but it's not going to go away. It's, it's probably the biggest growth area in, in higher education is, is e-learning. The future, I don't know exactly what it's going to look like, but I know that if you embrace it, there's lots of opportunities for people who, who do embrace it. Um, I'm involved in things now, um, both in school and outside of school, that I never thought I would ever be involved in, um, and it's because of, of e-learning. And that's the end of my formal, and I'm not sure who's keeping track of the time. I hope I'm not over, but um, we're good. Questions, discussion, thoughts? Throwing tomatoes is okay, because I'm still pretty quick. Yes, sir? We don't have a version of that. My advice to you is to create one because people will expect it. Um, I'll give you a quick example. Um, my wife did a career change. She went from sales to, 
teaching fourth grade. Um, so she had to get certified, and one of the things she had to do was take courses. So she had to take, a, so they said, here, take these courses. These courses you can take anywhere. You can take them online to community college. So she signed up for this online course at a community college I will not name. It wasn't here. And basically, they had part of the course as design where you had to come into campus to do a presentation, even though this was an online course. So somebody in her class said, look, my expectation was when I signed up for this course, I wouldn't have to drive three hours from St. Mary or wherever she went. It was a three hour drive, that's what I remember. I wouldn't have to drive it. So my message is students will expect it, so I would create the online version at some point. We're going through the same thing with our orientation. We always had an in-person orientation, but now that we're online, obviously we need an online orientation because it's just not going to be practical for some people. Questions? I've, I've disengaged you now. Well, thank you very much for the opportunity. I really appreciate it.